Uh, Rafi, it is. It is now. Okay, alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa usalli wa usallimu ala al-mab'uthi rahmatan lil-alameen. Nabiyina wa habibina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. So, inshallah, Monday night or Tuesday night will enter the blessed month of Dhul Hijjah. And so, uh, I thought that today what we'll do is we'll talk about some of the virtues of this blessed month. And we talk about some of the wada'if or some of the acts of worship that we should be concentrating on in this month. And then I'll conclude by talking about udhiya or qurbani and try to answer some of the most commonly question, commonly asked questions uh, uh, during the session. If you have any questions, if you're on YouTube live, just type the questions in uh, on the chat and also in, uh, on Zoom as well, you can uh, type the questions in on the chat. So, the, when we look to the texts of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, we learn that actually the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah are blessed days. And these days hold great significance with Allah. And indeed, when we look at the text, we learn, as many scholars state, that the beginning 10 days of Dhul Hijjah are the best days of the year. They're the best days of the year. And many scholars state, that they are better days than even the days of the last 10 days of Ramadan. But they state that the last 10 nights of Ramadan are better than the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. So the days of Dhul Hijjah, the first 10, are the best days of the year. And the best nights of the year are the last 10 nights of Ramadan. And in this beginning of this blessed month falling on the 10th of the hijjah as we know is the day of eid and based upon the hadith the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that this was the best day of the year in the sight of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and some scholars also said the day of arafah the 9th of the hijjah is the best day as well so the best day of the year according to the more stronger view as ibn Taymiyyah says is the day of eid al-adha the day of sacrifice and the best day of the week is the day of Jumu'ah. The best day of the year is Eid al-Adha. And some scholars say the day of Arafah. And the best day of the week is the day of Jumu'ah. And overall, as a combination, the best 10 days together are the days of Dhul Hijjah. Our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, A'adhumu al-ayyam indallahi yawmun nahr. That the best of the days in the sight of Allah is a day of sacrifice, meaning a day of Eid. And in fact, we learn in the Quran, or we learn from a hadith of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, that Allah has actually taken an oath by these 10 days in the Quran. And, only, and Allah only ever takes an oath with something that is important, that is significant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wal fajr, walayalin ashr. Allah says by the dawn or by Fajr and by the 10 nights and by the even and the odd. So Allah has taken an oath by these objects. And our messenger has reported in a hadith in the Musnad of Ahmad that uh, he said that the 10 nights are the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah and the odd is the day of Arafah and the even is a day of Eid. Because Arafah occurs on the 9th and Eid occurs on the 10th. So it's reported in the hadith in the Musad of Ahmad and Ibn Rajib said the hadith is Hassan. He said that the 10 in this surah, Surah Al-Fajr, the 10 refer to the 10 days of Dhul-Hijjah. And the witr, the odd, refers to the day of Arafah. And the even, the even refers to the day of sacrifice. And Allah has taken an oath by each of these to show us how important they are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, with regards to the 10 days specifically, with regards to the 10 days specifically, our messenger sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam said, as in the hadith recorded by Bukhari, مَا مِنْ أَيَّامٍ الْعَمَلُ الصَّالِحُ فِيهَا أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ مِنْ هَذِهِ الْأَيَّامِ That there is no days, there are no days in which righteous deeds are more beloved to Allah than in these days, meaning the first 10 of Dhul Hijjah. Qalu ya Rasulullah, the Sahaba asked, O Messenger of Allah, walal jihadu fi sabilillah, 
not even jihad in the way of Allah. And he, alayhi salatu wa salam, replied, Walal jihadu fi sabrila. Not even jihad in the path of Allah. Illa rajulan kharaja bi nafsihi wa malihi thumma lam yarji' min thalika bi shay. Except in the case for a person who goes out to fight jihad, having expended his wealth and his self in that way, and then returns with neither, meaning that he is martyred in that path, except for that person. So not even jihad is better than righteous deeds in these days specifically, except for that particular person who goes out and is martyred in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, there is no deed more precious in the sight of Allah, nor greater in reward than a good deed done during these 10 days. More precious in the sight of Allah, nor greater in reward than a good deed done during these 10 days. And as I'm sure many of us know, this month, Dhul Hijjah, is one of the sacred months, which are referred to in the Quran, that there are four months that are sacred. And a messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, the year is 12 months, of which four are sacred. Three of these are consecutive, Dhul Ka'ada, Dhul Hijjah, and Muharram. Dhul Ka'ada, Dhul Hijjah, the month we're about to enter, and Muharram. And a fourth one as well, Rajab, which comes between Jumada and Sha'ban. And these four months are regarded to be sacred because of two main reasons. The first reason is that fighting is prohibited during these months unless initiated by the enemy. And the second reason is that they are sacred because transgression of Allah's commandments in these months is worse than at other times. To go against the commandments of Allah in these months is worse than at other times. And these months are sacred because they're generally blessed. And when we have a blessed period of time, brothers and sisters, we are recommended in these times of blessings to increase as much as possible our servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because in these blessed times and periods and occasions, the rewards and the excellence of the deeds are increased, as we just saw in the hadith I quoted. So generally speaking, in Dhul Hijjah, the rewards of deeds are greater and the excellence of deeds is greater with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So much so that in these particular months, in these particular days, a deed that would normally be less rewarding or less superior than another deed outside of these months gains prominence in these months. Even like the optional jihad, an action is done, other actions done in this month or in these days gain prominence over jihad. You know, and jihad normally is one of the greatest of good deeds and is, you know, superior to many other deeds outside of these particular days. So we live, we're coming to a blessed time where the reward and the excellence of deeds is increased and their superiority is incre increased with the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore we as servants of Allah should be doing our best, our utmost to increase in our worship in these days to gain, to, to, to make the most of this opportunity that Allah has graced us with. Now before we continue, one point I need to make uh, clear is that there are many people who say that deeds in this in these 10 days have a specific increase in reward and there are hadith that talk about this but they're all weak so for example is a hadith in tirmidhi which is weak where it's reported that allah's messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that fasting each day of these 10 days is like fasting a whole year has a reward of fasting a whole year or praying by night of each night of these 10 days has a reward of praying the Laylatul Qadr has the reward of praying by Laylatul Qadr this is quite a famous hadith that many people quote but it's a weak hadith so there's no authentic hadith that gives us specific rewards for specific deeds but we do know that generally speaking rewards are increased and the superiority superiority of the deeds 
is increased. I hope that's clear. If there's any questions while I'm speaking, you can ask in the chat, inshallah, and I can try to answer. So the point I want to get to, and what, what I want to understand, what, what I want us to understand from this introduction, is that we need to capitalize on this opportunity that Allah has blessed and graced us with. It is a blessing from Allah that He allows us to live, to see certain occasions and certain times which are blessed with Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, like Ramadan, like the 10 days of the Hijjah. So in these days, generally speaking, we should try to increase, ensure we pray, definitely pray the obligatory prayers. In, ensure that we pray the sunnah prayers. Increase in our optional prayers. Pray by night if we can. Increase in our recitation and contemplation of the Quran. Increase in our dua. Increase in our dua. Increase in our istighfar. Repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Increase in our helping other human beings. Increase in doing everything and anything that our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. Now, specifically speaking, we should try to fast. It's reported in Abu Dawood that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would fast on the nine days of Dhul Hijjah and the day of Ashura and, the three, and three days of each month. The nine days of Dhul Hijjah, the day of Ashura, and three days of each month. And it's specifically recommended to fast on the day of Arafah. And the day of Arafah is a day of Hajj. Now, unfortunately, in this month, because of COVID-19, Hajj is severely restricted, and the overwhelming majority of Muslims will not be granted the opportunity of performing Hajj on this, in this year. But the importance and significance of the day of Arafah remains. It's a day of Hajj, and the Prophet وسلم, was asked about fasting on the day of Arafah. And this is for the non pilgrims. Fasting on the day of Arafah for the non pilgrims. And he said, it will expiate the sins of the previous year and the next year. It will expiate the sins, meaning the minor sins, not the major sins. It will expiate the sins of the previous year and the coming year. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he said, he was asked about fasting the day of Ashura. And the day of Ashura is the day that Musa alayhi salam was saved. He was asked about fasting this day. And he said it will expiate the sins of the past year. It will expiate or cancel out the sins, meaning the minor sins of the past year. Now the scholars have discussed why is there this, this discrepancy? Why is there more reward for fasting the day of Arafah than there is the day of Ashura. And they said that the reason why there's more reward of fasting the day of Arafah is because the day of Arafah is linked directly to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the day of Ashura is linked to the Prophet Musa Alayhi Islam. And because the Prophet Muhammad has a higher status with Allah than the Prophet Musa, the reward of a day linked to him is greater than the reward of a day linked to Musa Alayhi Wasallam. And of course, both messengers are great messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we believe in both and we love and honor both. And of course, the day of Arafah falls in these 10 days. And as I mentioned, according to the view of some scholars, not many scholars, but some scholars, the day of Arafah is actually the greatest day of the year. And Allah again in the Quran takes an oath by this day. In Surah Baruj, Allah says, wa shahidin wa mashhud. By the witnessing day and the witnessed day. The day that is witnessing and the day that is being witnessed. And again, the Prophet ﷺ himself explained what this ayah means. He said the witness day is a day of Arafah. And the witnessing day is a day of Jumu'ah, is a day of Friday. The witness day is the day of Arafah, and the witnessing day is the day of Jumu'ah. Ah. So again, Allah has taken an oath by both these days, the day of Arafah and the day of, of Jumu'ah, ah, showing us the significance these days have with him. 
And the reason why some scholars said that there is the day of Arafah is the greatest day of the year is because of this hadith in Ibn Khuzaymah, which is authentic. Where the Prophet wasallam said, there is no better day in the sight of Allah than the day of Arafah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends to the lowest heaven on this day. And he boasts about the people of the earth to the angels. And he says to the angels, look to my slaves. They have come to me with disheveled hair. They're covered in death, dust, standing in a forenoon. They have come from every distant pass. They seek my mercy, although they have not seen my punishment. And the Messenger of Allah said, there's no day when Allah sets free more slaves from hell than on the day of Arafah. Than on the day of Arafah. And the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa in Sahih Muslim, there is no day, there is no day on which Allah ransoms more of his slaves from the fire than on the day of Arafah. He, draw close, he draws close to his servants and he boasts about them before the angels. And he asks his angels, even though he knows better, what are my people, what are my servants asking for? And this indicates to us that the day of Arafah is a day of du'a. And many scholars, in fact, the majority of scholars say that it's a day of du'a, not just for the person, the pilgrim who's standing at Arafah, but also for those who are unable to do the Hajj, for those who are non-pilgrims. It is for them a day of du'a as well. The day of du'a for the whole of the servants, the entirety of Allah's servants, pilgrim and non-pilgrim. It's a day that Allah answers du'a. It's a day that Allah ransoms people from hellfire. It's a day that we are recommended strongly to make du'a as much as possible. And our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, in fact, sorry, before that, in fact, it's reported from the Salaf, Ibn Abbas and others, that on the day of Arafah, when they were not pilgrims, they would gather together in the masjids and they would make du'a to Allah. They would go to the masjid and they would make du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the day of Arafah, when they were not pilgrims. And Imam Ahmad was asked about this act that he that's reported from the Salaf, and he said there's nothing wrong with this. He himself personally did not do it, but he said there's nothing wrong with this, and I hope that there's good in it as well. So even the Salaf, on the day of Arafah, when they were not pilgrims, when they were not hujjaj, they would go to the masjid, and make du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a day of du'a for all of us. And on that day, the Messenger of Allah recommended us to say this particular dhikr and du'a. La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la. Lahu al-mulku wa lahu al-hamdu wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la. Lahu al-mulk wa lahu al-hamdu wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. These 10 days, besides the fasting, the fasting, the nine days, and especially the day of Arafah, these 10 days, besides the dua of, on the day of Arafah, these are days of dhikr. These are days of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, there are no days greater in the sight of Allah in which righteous deeds are more beloved to him than these 10 days. So during these days, recite a great deal of tahleel, tahleel, tahleel meaning la ilaha illallah, and takbir, Allahu Akbar, and tahmeed, alhamdulillah. So during these 10 days, recite a great deal of, the, of these adhkar. And he, alayhi salatu wasalam, also said the days of tashriq, the three days after Eid, are the days of eating and drinking and the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The days of eating and drinking and the dhikr of Allah. In these 10 days, besides a general dhikr, we're also specifically recommended to make takbir, the days of takbir in these 10, in these ten days. 
the general and the takbir is of two types. There's a general takbir and there's a specific takbir. In the first nine days, we make a general takbir. And this is for the men to say loudly everywhere in the masjid, in the house, on the street, in the marketplace. Ibn Umar and Abu Huraira would go to the marketplace in these nine, in nine days and recite the takbir loudly. And when the people heard them reciting the takbir loudly, they too would start reciting the takbir as well. The men say it loudly. Women should also say it, but they say it quietly. What's the form that these takbirs take? There's actually leeway. Any form of takbir is fine. As stated by Imam Ahmed and others. Any form of takbir is fine. However, there are some specific ones that are reported from the Salaf, from the Sahaba. And inshallah, we'll, re we'll release uh, later on today or tomorrow. We'll release a small article that has, you know, just a very short article that has each of these takbirs listed. So, for example, one of the more famous ones is Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Walillahi alhamd. So, say these takbirs loudly. And then we have the specific takbir. And the specific takbir is said in addition to the general takbirs. And it starts from Fajr on the day of Arafah. It starts from Fajr on the day of Arafah and it ends on the Maghrib on the last day of Tashriq. The day of Tashriq meaning the three days that follow Eid itself. So it starts from Fajr on Arafah and it ends on Maghrib on the last day of Tashriq. And on these days specifically, you say these same takbirs after each obligatory prayer. So after the prayer, you know, you after you say the taslim, you say, uh, you know, say your istighfar, and then you say, Allahumma anta salam, wa minka salam, tabarak, ya dal jalali wal ikram. And then after that, you start saying the takbirs. There's no specific number of times you need to say them, but you start saying these takbirs after each prayer. So in these days, you have this general takbir, which you say all the time, and then you have the specific takbir, which is the same takbir said again, that start from Fajr of Arafah and end after Maghrib, the last day of Tashriq, and you say these for men and women after each obligatory prayer. After each obligatory prayer. So you say, Allahumma <laughs> taslam wa minka salam tabaraka yadal jalali wal ikram, then you say, Allahu akbar, Allahu akbar, la ilaha illallah, Allahu akbar, Allahu akbar, wa lillahi alhamd, and so on. So we have the du'a I mean, we should be saying on the day of Arafah. We have the fasting. We have the, uh, the adhkar, general dhikr, we should be saying throughout the 10 days. We have the takbir, the general takbir, and the specific takbir. And then one of the greatest deeds we can do in these 10 days is to offer an udhya, is to offer a sacrifice. And if you can do it yourself, you should do it yourself. But if you can't, you can appoint a representative or you can deputize another person to do it on your behalf. So for example, us living in this country, it's very difficult and against, in fact, against the law in many places to actually sacrifice ourselves. So we are then allowed to deputize another, be it in this country, somewhere else or abroad, to uh, have them sacrifice on our behalf. So we pay for the sacrifice and then that person goes and does a sacrifice on our behalf. This is perfectly legitimate. And Alhamdulillah, WISE does it every year, has organizes this every year in Palestine and Yemen and Syria and so on and so forth. And again, a link is, is given out usually uh, that allows you to pay for those sacrifices. Now, when it comes to a sacrifice, you sacrifice you know, a sheep or a goat uh, or, uh, or, you, or a lamb, or you sacrifice a portion of a larger animal, like one seventh of a cow or one seventh of a camel. Now, this sacrifice is done by the head of a household. It's done by the head of the household. And the head of the household is the male, is a father or is a husband. It's the male, basically. The head of the household in Islam is regarded to be the male, be it the father or the husband. And the head of a household offers one animal or one share of an animal on behalf of the entire household. He does not offer an animal for each member of the family. I hope that's clear, right? So the head of the household, 
He offers one sacrifice on behalf of the entire family, no matter how large that family is. You know, if he's been blessed with like 50 children, 100 children, doesn't matter. One animal or one share of an animal on behalf of that entire family. He does not offer one animal per adult or one animal per member of the family. He does not offer one share of an animal per member of the family. One share of a larger animal is the same as one animal or one smaller animal. Abu Ayyub in the Hadith in Tirmidhi, he was once asked, how was the sacrifice done at the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And he replied, a man would sacrifice a sheep on behalf of himself and the members of his family. And they would eat some of that meat and feed others with some of that meat. And indeed, this was a practice for the Messenger Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. He, Aisha radiallahu anha, reports that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordered one ram to be brought and he sacrificed it. And he said, in the name of Allah, while sacrificing it, he said, in the name of Allah, accept this sacrifice on behalf of Muhammad and the family of Muhammad and the Ummah of Muhammad. And then he sacrificed it. The point being, he offered just one animal and he, didn't offer, he did not offer an animal for himself and an animal for Aisha and an animal for Umm Salama and an animal for his other wives and an animal for his children, no. He did one animal for himself and his family. And this was the sunnah. Every year, this was a, it's reported in Sahih Muslim, this is what he would do every year. So the head of the household, he offers one sacrifice on behalf of the entire household. And he does not offer a sacrifice for each member of the household. The head of the household is the male mem the male head of the household, uh, which is a which is as I said the husband or the father. Is it permissible? Once I've said the head of the household, is it permissible if a woman she's got her her own wealth? Is it permissible for her to offer a sacrifice on behalf of herself? P perfectly fine, perfectly fine. She can do that if she wants to. Even if the head of the household has offered one on behalf of the whole family. If she wants to, she can do so on her own behalf with her own wealth, with her own wealth. What she cannot do is offer a sacrifice on behalf of the entire household. If the head of a household is present and doing his own sacrifice for the whole household. But if she's a single mother, for example, then it's permissible in this case for her to offer a sacrifice on behalf of her entire family, her children. So I hope that's clear. The woman can offer, offer a sacrifice for herself. And if she is a single mother, she can offer a sacrifice for, on behalf of her direct family. But if the father is there, the husband is there, he offers a sacrifice for the entire family. And, and she offers, she can offer one for herself. Now, it's mentioned, some scholars also mentioned here that, you know, if the father, if the head of the household, the male is poor, for example, and the woman has a lot of wealth, can she offer sacrifice on behalf of the whole household? And they said, yes, provided she has permission from the head of the household. Provided she has permission from the head of the household. So I hope that's clear. So that's regards to a woman uh, 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 doing uh, a sacrifice. Now, what is a household? What defines a household? And a household is basically the people living in one house. That's effectively a household, right? And that can be, you know, the husband, the wife, the children. It can even be the relatives, right? So. That's regarded to be one household. Anybody living under one house. And it's a head of that household who gives on behalf of that entire household. Now, if in that household you have two, no, for example, again, I'm just I'm trying to, these are questions I'm asked every year, so I'm just trying to answer them all here. So we have a video recording of them. If you have two independent families living under one roof, right? 
who, do they give two separate sacrifices or not? Now, if you have two independent families living under one roof and they're independently paying, paying the bills and they're independently maintaining themselves, then yes, even though they're living under one roof, they're regarded to be two households because of this independence, right? They're independently maintaining themselves. They're independently paying the bills, separately paying the bills. In written, and therefore, the, each family gives a sacrifice on behalf of itself. But if you have two families where you still have one head of the household, and perhaps another family may just you know, volunteer to help with the, with the costs of, a, of, of running the household, may volunteer to help with the bills and so on, then it's just one sacrifice given by the head of the household on behalf of the entire household. I hope that's clear. So if you have two families living under one household, uh, if they're completely independent, then they completely independently give a sacrifice. But if you have two families living in the one household, and even if they're earning one, you still have that official head of the household, and another family may you know, voluntarily contribute towards the costs of maintaining that household, then it's sufficient for the head of the household, sufficient for the head of the household to give one sacrifice on behalf of everybody. So a common example here would be you have a, a father living with his mother, with his wife, and then you have the son living with his, with his, with his wife in one household, right? And the, the, you know, the official head of the household is a father. It's sufficient for the head of the household, the father in this case, to give one sacrifice on behalf of everybody. But it's perfectly legitimate for the father to give his sacrifice and the son, if he wants to, to give his own sacrifice as well. What if one, if you're one head of more than one household? So say a person, has got three wives, for example, each living in a separate house, right? So he, he's, he, is, basically the he is basically the head of three families. In this case, the scholar said he still gives just one sacrifice on behalf of all of them, because effectively they are all one household as far as he is concerned, from his perspective of being the head of a household. Can you give more than one sacrifice or can I, as the head of a household, give more than one sacrifice? This is permissible. So I can you know, choose to give two, two animals or three animals or whatever. This is permissible. Okay. So that's me thinking about all the questions I'm, I'm normally asked about sacrifice every year. I hope I haven't confused anybody. Um, if you have any questions, you can either ask them in the chat 